This micro lecture is on photosynthetic organisms and animals. When you have an opportunity, please visit the attached links and learn about algae that can be engineered to have high performance cellulose in their cell walls. Algae always have some cellulose, but this can be improved and because they have no lignin, they could potentially be an excellent source of tree-free cellulose. Algae have a lot of potential to improve a lot of industries, and even though they are challenging and expensive to produce right now, they are certainly worth paying attention to. Please take a moment to review this week's learning objectives. This week we are covering biological conversions, our fourth biomass conversion pathway type. Photosynthetic organisms like algae and plants do not need to be fed sugar or kept in a low oxygen environment like fermentation microbes. They produce their own sugars using photosynthesis, and they do not really need oxygen as much as they need carbon dioxide. Photosynthetic organisms can be high-tech like algae used for fuels, or low-tech like canola and peanut plants that are used to produce vegetable oils. Likewise, animals are their own class because they require oxygen and can be fed more complicated forms of biomass that haven't yet been turned into sugar. Mammals tend to produce oils in the form of fats, which are often converted into oils after harvesting. Insects have long been used to produce chemicals and are quickly gaining interest as a source of oil as well. Like grains, animals are often overlooked in all the bioenergy media, and this is unfortunate because they currently play a role, and will likely continue to play an increasing role, in the biological conversion of biomass into useful chemicals and fuels. When we think about algae, we always think about green ponds outside. This is ironic because some of the most valuable commercial algae products are generated by growing algae inside, in the dark. Algae really only need the sun to produce sugars that they then consume to grow. So if you provide the sugar, they don't technically need the sun, and then you can work on getting that algae to focus on making what you need. Free solar power is cheaper than sugar, so this isn't always economic, but for some things it really is. Two companies that have done this and done well are Martech, founded in 1985, and Solozyme, founded in 2010. They have both engineered algae that grow in the dark, similar to yeast, and must be fed sugar to grow. These algae can be 70-80% to 80 oil by weight when harvested, and they can produce a variety of other valuable chemicals as well. Even though growing algae in the dark does some neat things, growing algae in the light is certainly the most popular way to use them. Right now, the vast majority of algae grown in the light are used as food and for nutritional supplements like astaxanthin. There is also a growing algal pigment industry based on raceway ponds like the ones shown in this picture. Two of the larger algal biofuels companies that use outside ponds are Sapphire Energy and Synthetic Genomics. Sapphire is working hard to produce algae cheaply enough that they can be converted into a crude oil that can then be sent to an oil refinery. Synthetic Genomics has a slightly different strategy and would like to produce algae-rich and valuable oils and fuel chemicals. Hopefully they figure out how to make it economic, as outside ponds take most advantage of algae's natural strength at using sunlight instead of sugar. One of the neater directions algae has taken lately is the production of chemicals by excreting them. A company called Algonol uses an algae that actually excretes ethanol into the water around it. Their direct-to-ethanol process was invented in 1984 and uses blue-green algae to make ethanol directly from intense carbon dioxide and sunlight in salt water. As a company, Algonol was founded in 2006 and built a pilot plant in 2011. As a company, Algonol was founded in 2006 and built a pilot plant in 2011. They use massive quantities of small bioreactors instead of open ponds, and they hope to build a large commercial facility soon. Like Algonol, but aimed in a different direction, Juul Unlimited is working to use cyanobacteria that excretes fatty acids and other diesel precursors into the water around them. They were founded in 2007 and built a pilot plant in 2010. They also hope to build a commercial facility soon. Back when we discussed history, we talked about tapping the pines and the naval stores industry. We have been tapping pines since the Middle Ages, and naval stores was a massive U.S. industry from the 1700s until the 1960s. This is a perfect example of plants and trees generating chemicals and fuels. However, 
Naval stores is an old technology, and it can be dramatically improved by using techniques available today. The DOE is funding a program called Petro, Plants Engineered to Replace Oil, that aims to do just this, and so far they have made some significant advances. The idea of growing crops that are a living part of an integrated biorefinery is a fascinating idea, and this promises to be an exciting area of development. Oilseed crops are a major global business. There is no better example of plants being used for biological conversions than oilseed crops. The production of those oils is a biological conversion, and the extraction of those oils is a mechanical conversion. And combined, these conversions generate a massive source of plant-derived oils utilized by every nation in the world. Like any other major agricultural effort, this comes with its share of problems and challenges. But despite these, it is important to consider the value that plants bring in being able to produce oils like this. The noble tunicat will be mentioned twice because it is unique and forces us to think outside the box. One of the most interesting new sources of biomass being considered is an ocean animal called a tunicate. It is one of the only known animals on Earth that produces cellulose, and furthermore, it produces quite a bit. Tunicates are currently being investigated very closely as a new source of cellulose and protein. Like algae for cellulose, being able to farm tunicates for cellulose production could be a major paradigm changer. We talked about the value of grain as a source of biomass, and it is equally important to remember that animal fat is a major source of biologically available oils for bioenergy. We have been using animal fats for oils much longer than we have been using petroleum, so it is not cheap and there is always a market for it somewhere. Ironically, the price of animal fat oil and petroleum has been pretty similar for the last 20 years or so. We don't usually look at a cow, pig, or a turkey and go, wow, what an oil source. But fat and oil are an important product generated by these animals, so it's good to think about it. This graph makes important statements about the quantity of animal fat produced every year and how stable that production has been for many years. Four to five million metric tons of animal fat is quite a bit, about on the order of what a small to medium-sized oil field produces every year. If you are curious, you can look up a list of oil field sizes online. This level of animal fat would be the equivalent of about 30 million barrels of oil a year, which is on the order of about 0.1 million barrels a day. You should be able to use those numbers and metrics to compare them to real oil fields that you find online. From my perspective, insects are one of the most interesting new sources of oil to come around in quite a while. They eat a very wide variety of biomass and waste biomass, and they live in conditions that are easy for us to support. Many species are naturally high in oils, and even more could be genetically engineered to produce either oils or chemicals of interest. There are many industries using insect chemicals today, so there is precedent for this kind of biological conversion. From the bioenergy perspective, it has the promise of being a very technologically simple biological conversion that could be done in a consolidated way in rural areas, and that is always interesting. So let's revisit some major themes. Biological conversions often make chemicals difficult for humans to synthesize easily. Think about the latter rains. Living organisms live to grow and reproduce, not to make products for humans. They also mostly live in water. Without water, they die. These chemicals can be inside or outside of the organism and must be captured and concentrated. Fermentations are well understood and can make a variety of liquid and gaseous fuels, and genetic engineering is rapidly increasing the number of organisms that secrete and excrete valuable products. This image shows someone holding one of the largest single-celled organisms on Earth. This organism is an algae called Valonia ventricosa, and believe it or not, but that entire green ball is technically just one cell. It is somewhat compartmentalized and has countless mobile nuclei giving instructions to keep things running, but basically it is just one massive cell. Usually when we think of cells, we think of something we have to look at through a microscope, so it is fascinating that this type of algae makes us rethink what it really is to be a single-celled organism.